It's very exciting to be sitting here at the launch of the seventh edition of the Leaders of Tomorrow. We've been on air for six years and uh, kicking off the seventh year with a panel like this with representation across different sectors, strategic people who look at the big picture, people who have their pulse on funding as far as companies go, academia, someone involved very closely with social entrepreneurship. It's very exciting, so thank you all for your time this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us here this morning. We will be taking questions from the audience for this panel, so do keep them ready. I will be coming to you all in just a bit. But I thought I would kick off today's discussion by talking about innovation and disruption for entrepreneurs. That, of course, is our theme. So I thought let's set the stage uh, by asking each of you, perhaps, for your views on whether innovation and disruption necessarily go hand in hand. Can innovation outstrip innovation? Should it outstrip innovation? And should innovation outstrip disruption as far as the economy is concerned and for businesses? And Whitney, let me come to you first. Yeah. So what I would say is that disruption is a kind of innovation. Um, you can innovate without being disruptive, but you can't really be disruptive without innovating, certainly in the good, in the good context. So there, it's a subset of innovation. So just one moment, please. Uh... Oh, do you want me to use this instead? Sorry, we'll just take a moment to ensure that we've got the audio on this right because this panel is going to go on television. And while we're taking a break of a second, this is just a hygiene announcement for the crowd this morning. Could I kindly request that you put your cell phones on silent so there are no audio disruptions? All right, we're good to go. Uh, thank you so much for that, Whitney. Let me come to this side of the panel then. Uh, Mira? If I can come to you first, if we can talk about innovation and disruption, you're someone that looks very closely at small businesses, you work very closely with social entrepreneurs, you look very closely at ensuring that those who are in the informal sector are given the right skill sets to be able to join the formal sector. Do you see enough, perhaps, of innovation which is happening uh, in this space? Um, okay, let me answer this question a little differently. I think as a social entrepreneur myself, innovation is the heart of our work. Um, when we began this journey, we found uh, the dream was big. The dream was to mainstream hiring of youth with disabilities so that it helps companies, it helps their business and not out of sympathy and empathy. But because of mindsets of companies and because it was new, there were no jobs, so what do you do? If you went to a company and said hire, they said hire where? So that's how we began on a journey of innovating to find out for companies where the jobs are. And to give you a very quick example, what we did was we looked at industries which are high growth industries like the retail, for example. And we said, okay, what's a position which is across everywhere, which will generate huge number of jobs? And that was the cashier. And the cashier job was not available for youth with disabilities. So we said, let's prove to one retail company that we can do it. So we cracked that. My youth sat there, worked with the speech and hearing impaired, and we created what is called a silent cashier. When the company did a survey to see what was better, is this, do customers prefer a silent cashier or a talking cashier? What do you think was the answer? The silent cashier. As a result, this one position of cashier, which is so common across all malls and everywhere, has now got mainstream for youth with disabilities. Very, uh, very fascinating what you do uh, at your company. Uh, Amit, let me come to you about the intersection between innovation and disruption and your thoughts on that. So I think uh, if you really talk about innovation and disruption, I think they go hand in hand. Uh, the fundamental point that we have to look at from the point of view of competitiveness is that like we get it horribly wrong thinking that there are 
uh, innovative industries or high-tech industries and low-tech industries. There is nothing like a high-tech industry or a low-tech industry. You can be innovative in anything that you're actually doing. There are high-tech firms or low-tech firms. So what we're effectively saying is that you can do innovation in agriculture to what you call a software and so on and so forth. What we are doing here is that we fundamentally look at IT or software just as innovation, whereas it is actually a body shop. So quite a lot of firms that you actually think are innovative firms are effectively uh, body shops or they're actually talking about labor arbitrage. So we have to understand this from a very fundamental viewpoint as to what is innovation. And it can happen anywhere, in any kind of business, in any sphere of business, or any sphere of life. Okay. Sam? The way I look at innovation, I agree with, um, with you, Whitney. The, um, the point is this. Innovation can be incremental, right? <coughs> Disruption is when that innovation happens in a huge step, a huge surge, and it goes to a totally different, totally different plane. So from a letter to email, that is huge disruption of the entire postal system. But then when you take a company, when you take a process, let's say people are cold calling um, to get customers, you could incrementally change the effectiveness of the cold calling by saying that touch these customers using a web-based um, mailer or a pop-up or whatever that may be, and then cold call. Now, if you did that, the effectiveness, the yield on that cold call, if it is a half a percent or one percent, you could literally double and triple that, right? To me, that is innovation. You have dramatically increased productivity, but at the same time, that is not disruption entirely. That is skunk works. That happens totally separately. So the way I look at it, as innovation can continuously happen, it's a continuous process and it should happen, but disruption doesn't happen all the time in every company, uh, but it should be looked at and should be observed and should be loved and should be encouraged all the time. Okay. The conversation in, uh, on technology, of course, is a much larger conversation. I will just come back to those points that you raised, but uh, let me come to Professor Krishnan and get his thoughts. So I would just like to take the simple example of Toyota. If you look at the history of Toyota, it's always been regarded as a very competitive automotive company. But for many years, the heart of their competitiveness was the small improvements they made in productivity on a continuing basis thanks to improvements in the shop floor, improvements in how they manufactured or assembled cars on the assembly line, things like that. Not very romantic, not very exciting, but certainly at the heart of their competitiveness. But then Toyota was also seen as a slightly boring company. It wasn't seen as the most exciting company in the world till they came out with this car called Prius. Prius was the first commercially exploited hybrid vehicle and Prius completely changed people's views of what Toyota is all about. So you could think of this incremental innovation that Sam was just talking about as the everyday oil or lubricant which drives competitiveness. But then from time to time, you have to take that jump. You have to go on a new trajectory. You have to change the way things are doing, being, sorry, the way things are being done in a fundamental way. And that's what Toyota did with the Prius. That's what disruption is all about. Fascinating to get so many different uh, takes on innovation and disruption, but one thing that we definitely talk about a lot on the leaders of tomorrow, and I'm also picking up from this panel, is the people involvement. It's about people. Whitney, I want to come to you on this. You've said previously that companies don't disrupt, people do. Why do you say that? How does that work? For employees at companies who are looking at innovation, perhaps, what should they keep in mind? Yeah, well, let me give a quick story that will really illustrate this. When I was working on Wall Street, uh, my bank was acquired, and then there was a shakeup, and my boss was fired, and I got moved to equity research. And um, when I got to equity research, they already had a cement and construction analyst, and that's what I was supposed to do. So all of a sudden, I'm in this place where I've gotten moved, I don't have a job, now I've gotten moved again, I don't have a job, and so... So what do I do? Like, how do I figure out how to find a place for myself so that I have a job still? And so as I looked around, I realized that there were a number of media companies that were going public, and there was no analyst to cover them. So as the theory of disruption would, would dictate, rather than knocking on this cement door, trying to do this job as a cement analyst that was very much closed to me, I built my own media door. And this is what it looks like for you as a disruptor, as a person, is in finding a place for me to play, finding something for me to do, 
I by default found a place for my company to play. And so one of the things, and the, that's why people disrupt not companies, is that as you find a place where no one else is playing for you, you will by definition find somewhere for your company to play. And so if you start with the people and trust that the people will figure out places to play, it's going to automatically find something innovative and an innovative direction for your company. Sam, I'd like for you to also actually comment on that question because apart from being very passionate, of course, about funding into businesses and finance, you also look very closely at the people angle. So how do you think they play? It's, it's, it's spot on, completely true. I, I completely agree with you. I don't know if this microphone is I'm, I'm not used to this. I work behind a desk. Just hold it. Love the mic. Um, people, what is an organization? What is a company? A large number of people coming together to execute on an idea and bring it to fruition so people can use the products and the services, or the services, or, or a combination of those. So, where does change start? Organizations are simply at a unit level, each individual, right? Somebody comes up with an idea, somebody says, this idea can be helpful to you, you, you. It may be in totally different ways, as they think that idea will be helpful. So they are the disruptors, if you really think about it. They are the idea owners. And when you aggregate that with process and product and everything around it, it becomes a company, right? So when you really want change to happen, if you try to institutionalize that change from top down, which is what companies do when they change processes, when they change structures, organizations, and so forth, they get it done. It takes time, they get it done, but that is incremental. When you talk about true innovation, it has to start with an individual who then gets ownership for that idea within the organization, within the team, within the organization, and then hopefully the company, that's when a Prius is formed in a Toyota. There would have been massive resistance for a Prius when it first started, and then over time, that, that vaporized, and then the car became reality. Now, this is hard to happen in a large company like Toyota repeatedly, which is why, I mean, Elon Musk need not have happened at all, right? It could have happened in Toyota or GM or Ford easily. That's where the individual comes in. The individual is able to see the vision, have the vision, love the vision, feel the vision, and then go out and create it. As difficult as it may be, that is why the individual completely carries that innovation. I mean, I'm a firm believer, which is why even when we invest in companies, when the companies don't do well, sometimes we decide to stick on with it. We may take a full write down, but it's the individual we have invested in. They could go on and do two, three, four, five more companies over their, uh, over their career, which could be outstanding. Okay, so speaking of individuals, my question to the side of the panel, uh, and in fact, let me open this up to all of you on the panel. How do leaders who are leading organizations ensure that they're encouraging innovation in the company? How do, uh, how do uh, leaders ensure that they are ready for companies of the future that are being disrupted? What should they keep in mind? What should they do? Yeah, so I think the leadership has a huge role to play in encouraging innovation in a company are two or three things which would seem to be critical. One thing is they've got to be willing to listen to people. If they're not willing to listen to people, they're not going to get any ideas. So they've got to make sure that they're open to a whole set of sometimes even zany ideas that come from people across the organization. The second thing is they've got to let people experiment. See, ideas are in a sense easy to generate. Even sitting here, we can all generate lots of ideas, but we don't know whether those ideas will work. The only way we'll be able to figure out whether an idea really has potential is if we try it out. But if we are really scared that if we try something out and it fails and we're going to get our head cut off or lose our job or something drastic is going to happen, there's absolutely no way we're going to experiment with that idea. So it's not enough if you're just open to ideas. You've also got to be willing to let people experiment and fail. And the third part of this is you probably got to provide some resources, you've got to provide some encouragement, maybe you even need to have people who will help you take those ideas forward, maybe as catalysts or idea champions, because particularly when you go to the large organization context, there's so many barriers to innovation. And unless there are people at the top who are willing to you know, pull out those ideas from the bottom, encourage them, 
guide them past the corporate bureaucracy, make sure capital is available, you're not going to see those ideas flourish. So, uh, you know, like just taking up from uh, what uh, Rishi had actually said, two or three things. Uh, one is that I fundamentally believe that it's all about perspectives. So how do you build a fresh perspective, looking out of the box? Uh, because I think what happens is that each one of us suffers from what we would call as associative barriers. And how do we break those associative barriers of our culture, of our education, and so on and so forth. So that becomes exceedingly important. And the second thing is, I think, what you call as risk-taking or ability to do something new. I think we should actually be fearless. We should actually not take that risk of failure. I think quite a lot of us are so scared of failure. Uh, and we would not really want to do 90% or 99% of the things because what people would say. Uh, I think the most important, the third most important factor for success is that you should at least get fired from your job once in your life. <laughs> if you have not been fired from your job once in your life, that means you have not done enough or you have not been innovative or creative enough because if you get it done, I think it is superb for you and for your career and for your betterment. So that is how I would actually look at it. Uh, I think I always say that I did get fired quite nearly and I've actually been successful because of that itself. Uh, had I not been close to get fu getting fired, uh, I would have just got stuck where uh, I could have actually been. Yeah. You're raising a very interesting and a very pertinent point, Amit. Do you think that uh, perhaps we talk enough about failures where entrepreneurs are concerned in India? Uh, Silicon Valley, the US for instance, uh, has this culture where they celebrate people who have had two, three ventures, gone on to, to do something else. Do you think perhaps we also need to learn that? That's something that we can pick up oh, as well? I, I think within your question is the answer itself. We have to celebrate failure all the time. Yeah. Uh, if you really look at Silicon Valley, they would actually give funding to people who have actually failed in the past. Uh, in fact, today when I actually work as a seed funder, I would always talk about people who have failed at least once or twice. Uh, they are actually willing to take the risk and they're not job seekers. Uh, I think failure also is a very interesting question of job seeking. The moment you look at job seeking, it just kills that whole idea of freedom and so on and so forth. Celebration of failure is exceedingly important across the board and that is when new things actually happen. In fact, if you talk about nature itself, nature celebrates failures. Uh, and in fact, at the end of the day, the most inefficient machine in the world, which is called humans, is one of the most successful machines. Like it's, it's fairly inefficient. The only thing is you have a brain on your head. In fact, you, you don't have strength at all. Animals have better strength, but yeah. it's a failure of nature and you're successful there. Sure. Mira, I see you agreeing. Yeah. I think things are slowly changing, you know. For example, I remember at one point of time, if you were a startup and you failed, then it was considered like you wouldn't even put it on your bio data. But nowadays people don't mind, you know. They proudly show it because he's tried something and it's not worked, so it's okay. Uh, the second thing which I find interesting is I recently spoke at a conference on failure. I think people mm -hmm. now are talking about it and I think it's extremely important because if you're working in the same space, why should we all make the same mistakes? Like we learn from each other's best practices, I think it's extremely important to learn from each other's failures so that he doesn't make the same mistake. Okay, I have one more question for this panel before we come to the audience for any questions that they may have. And uh, since we're talking about people, and Whitney, you were talking previously about attrition, uh, I picked up some data points that suggest that India has one of the highest rates of attrition. Uh, at least for 2018, we were at about 14% compared to APAC, which was at about 11%. We have the demographic dividend on one hand, and on the other hand, you have employees who are changing jobs perhaps every one or two years. So my question for this panel is how you manage the two to ensure that the ultimate aim of innovation is not being hit. I, I think I answered that in the course of the presentation is that I think the attrition is happening because people are bored. They're not getting opportunities to learn. And so if we as managers are willing to acknowledge the fact that every single person who walks in our door is a learning machine, that they want the opportunity to not know how to do something, to learn how to do it, once they've mastered it, start over again, we'll be able to really stem the tide of attrition significantly if we're willing to, to practice that sort of human resources strategy. Professor Krishnan? Yeah. yeah I don't to think attrition is always a bad thing. Remember when we're talking about innovation, we are talking about new ideas. So when you have people who have been in the same organization for many years, having the same discussions around the same lunch table, and you know, ha having come to a conclusion on how that business is to be run, 
it's somewhat unlikely that you're going to have very revolutionary and disruptive ideas happening in that organization. But sometimes you can have a newcomer or some youngsters who enter the company who ask very fundamental questions about the way things are being done and therefore really shake up the place. The only exception to this, I suspect, would be when there's very specialized expertise required and that specialized expertise is cumulative, then having experts in the company who've been there for a long time would really help. But still, if you're really looking for people who will question the status quo, who will really shake things up, it's good to get new people in. And obviously, if you're getting new people in, some people will also leave. I think attrition is beautiful, uh, without a doubt. <laughs> Uh, and the reason is very simple. We should not forget the God principle of business. The God principle is generate, operate, and destroy. That means like something like what Whitney was also saying, that the S curve, or the God principle is that there is something that has to get started, it has to end as well. And that is the same thing. It's the age of ideas. Ideas will come, ideas will go, people will be there, people will go. In fact, we ourselves as natural beings, we die over a period of time. That's, that's the only consistent, constant uh, thing that we actually know of. So nature actually pushes people out of the system. That's the exact thing that should happen in corporations. So we should learn from biology that this is a beautiful thing to actually happen. Do you share that optimism? <laughs> <laughs> Attrition is costly. I, I, yeah. told, I mean, we run a business. I don't like attrition. I am the first one to say that. Having said that, some level of attrition is important, good, and encouraged. We used to take the view in investment banking in New York that the bottom 5% have to go every year. Now, there is problem in the bottom 5% as the business changes and the business needs to grow. But at the same time, it's a signal to the top people on the top that we are not only rewarding you, we are punishing the bottom, yeah? That is incentivizing the group to perform better. But then, toggling over to India where you said the attrition is higher, you can't look at it in isolation. When you look at these BPO style companies, technology is continuously changing, processes are getting more efficient. You don't need the same number of people to do the same low skill job as you did two years ago which fundamentally means you need some forced attrition, right? And with AI coming, there's going to be a whole heck of a lot more attrition at the bottom end, and that's going to increase. The important thing is to develop skills for these people so as they are changed from one job to another, that's what you were talking about, Whitney, that has got to be done on a massive scale, both by government and by company, so you don't lose the people that you have already trained and brought them to this level to, you know, before they, because they can't go to this level because this level is getting crushed. So it's important to foresee that and plan, but all attrition is not bad. Some attrition is good, but it's important to manage that attrition in a very smart, sensible way so you don't lose your talent because acquisition cost is, is high. All right, uh, on that note, let me open this up for questions. Anyone with a question, can we please have a mic there? If I can request for you to introduce yourself and also whom the question is to. Hi, I'm Abhinav. I'm from Acurex, a medical diagnostic company. And there's a lot of uh, disruption happening in our industry also, like point of care testing. So my question is to uh, Whitney. So if you look at uh, India, there's something called as frugal innovation, what we call in an Indian term as jugad. And uh, there's no big disruption happening like Ola, no, no sorry, like Uber, Airbnb, etc. So, and the same Indians, when they go to the Silicon Valley, they cause disruption like Hotmail, Vinod Kosla, etc. So what is the reason that they're not able to disrupt in India? Is it the ecosystem or uh, there's not enough support? And what is the solution that disruption can come out of India? That's a, re that's a really inter interesting question. So what you're saying is that inside of... So Indians aren't necessarily disrupting in India, yes. but they go to another market and they are. Yes. Well, that's a complicated question that you probably have to tease out. I No doubt there are some ecosystem questions at play. Um, but I also wonder, if I think about the idea of disruption, what is disruption doing? You're putting yourself in a situation of inexperience where you don't know, you don't know how to do what you're doing. And I wonder if part of the reason that Indians who are going to the United States or another country are innovating is they put themselves in an immigrant type of experience where they're questioning everything. And they're also not bound by the rules that they felt they were bound by in their home country. 
when you go to a new place, and Sam, you probably had this experience, you go to a new place, you, you, there's a sense of freedom or liberation. Um, I know I speak Spanish, and I speak Spanish very differently than I speak English because I don't have all the baggage like Amit was talking about. And so I wonder if the same thing is happening is when people are, are emigrating, these ideas of I can't do this or we're not allowed to do this or we, it doesn't work like this, all that goes away. And so then this wonderful creativity and this ability to, to innovate can come to the fore because what's going on in their head has gone away. So yes, the ecosystem's there, but I think a lot of it is what's going on inside of people's heads. So what's if the I solution? Just, uh, what's the solution? Oh, what's my solution? I think the solution is that we need to make it on our watch safe for the people who work for us to be innovative and not feel like, and so when they make mistakes, allow them to make mistakes. And if I can make one quick suggestion, whenever someone comes to work for you, there's this sense that if you tell them, good job, good job, good job, good job, they're still waiting. When are they going to tell me I'm doing a bad job? And so they're afraid that if they make a mistake, then they're going to be out. And so my advice to you is the very first day on the job, give someone some feedback on something that didn't work and then move on. So they'll go, oh, okay, it's okay. I made a mistake and it was okay. Now we can go on. And so if they, as soon as they know they've made a mistake and it's safe, then they're going to start to believe that they can innovate. And some of that head game that's going on will start to dissipate. Okay. Since he was talking about Uber, et cetera, I just want to uh, add a question that I had as far as large-scale innovation is concerned. We've had examples of Aadhaar, which is um, an identity uh, tech-based system here in India. We've had the electoral system, which a lot of people argue is one of the largest innovations that we've seen of its kind anywhere in the world. My question is, we do have examples of brilliant innovation in India, but we don't seem to have enough, and we don't seem to have enough which have scaled. This is a question for the panel. What perhaps will help us overcome that obstacle? So, you know, I think when you talk about scale, uh, it's a question that I always ask uh, myself. Uh, it's like the Amitabh Bachchan, classical Amitabh Bachchan problem. Why does Amitabh Bachchan make more money than Amit Kapoor? Uh, right? Or why does any actor make more money than Amit Kapoor? IQ on IQ, I think I probably will have a better IQ. Uh, so the question is, it is actually what you call as the arc of influence, the number of people that people are able to go to or they're able to talk to. Uh, so when you talk about Amitabh Bachchan or Salman Khan, he talks to close to about 60 million, 100 million people in one go and he just charges a rupee for every person and look at the scale that actually happens. That's the same thing that uh, Mr. Ambani does. If you really talk about geo itself, what is geo as an innovation? Geo as an innovation is of, about scale, understanding scale. I think the question is, do we have the perspective to look at scale? It's a problem that we can actually talk about in education as well, with the massive issue that we have in India of under-education. How do we actually look at that scale and take it to a large number of people? If we are able to do it, we are able to solve tons and tons of issues if we actually go along. So that, that's where it is. I think it's also to do with how good is your understanding of complex systems. If you look at the people who are involved with some of the innovations that you just spoke about, I think they understood the dynamics of large-scale change in a country like India pretty well. Nandan Nilekani, for example, realized, you know, you can't do it from outside. You have to be in the government. You have to be able to influence the decision-making process. You also see that he made sure that Aadhaar persisted. You know, even when the government changed, even though he had stood for election from a different party, yeah. he went very soon after the new government was formed and explained to Mr. Modi why Aadhaar was so important. So, you see, you need to really understand the whole system and how these changes are made. And then be willing or being able to put yourself into the system to ensure that you can get a lot of those barriers removed, which will ensure scaling and diffusion. I think um, every time I travel to rural areas and villages, I find there's so much of innovative work happening. Uh, to me, I think the key, if we really want to move to the next level, is networks. I think that how do you create a platform where um, information sharing can happen and how can you actually help those people who are sometimes cut off but doing something beautiful and innovative by themselves um, come together to create this big leap in innovation. 
Okay. The flip side to that question, of course, is that should we be looking at what's happening globally? Should we be aspiring for more Ubers here in India when the, the challenges and therefore the solutions that India needs are very unique to the country that we have. We still have villages that are not electrified, for instance. So should we be looking perhaps more closely at what's happening globally or should we look at innovations and solutions for the local market? You see, necessity is the mother of invention. Somebody said that. Every country, every place looks to solve their problems first, all right? So in the United States, cars are ubiquitous. Everybody's got one. I think the number is 1.1 or 1.2 cars per, per person. And then there are taxis, which were terrible. They didn't do the job. Somebody came up with an idea called Uber. Now, we did Ola here. It was a knockoff, to be fair, of Uber, right? We're asking, why are we not innovating like, like the United States? It's because we're not there yet. We don't need to. We're solving our problems, as you're saying. We innovate to solve our problems that are immediate to us, right? Which is what we would do, right? You, you, you sort your problems first. And then when you reach a stage where the problem set changes, then you innovate for those problem sets, right? So certain things, India has innovated probably in, in villages, uh, how water is carried, X, Y, Z, that is not there in the United States. So the thing is, we're probably looking, asking the wrong question by saying, why is innovation happening in Silicon Valley and not so much here, is probably looking at the right place to see it is happening, but they're solving their problems and we're solving our problems. And when the time comes, we will do all that same innovation that's happening in Silicon Valley type no, things think, in the future. Uh, you know, design thinking is, you know, rage these days. And one of the most important principles of design thinking is that you have to immerse yourself in the problem, immerse yourself in the context of people who are facing a challenge, only then can you come up with really creative solutions. So if you're going to be in India, it's very unlikely you can immerse yourself in the problem of somebody in the US or Europe. You can really understand problems here much better. Okay, I didn't mean to eat into the time of the audience oh. questions. Yeah, right here in front. Can we get it? Hello. Oh. Uh, good morning. Hi. Yeah. 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 Well, my name is Parth Zatakya and I'm a student. Uh, my question is open to the panel. Uh, the question is, typically the Indian student's mindset is very conservative in nature. Like, uh, he goes for job rather than uh, for job creation. So what kind of mindset is required if you want to create tomorrow's companies like Google or something like that? Yeah, so I think sometimes we are a bit unfair on uh, Indian students. I think Indian students are in a way sort of subject to the Indian education system. I have actually just one simple solution to answer many of these problems. The day parents in India stop doing school projects for their kids, kids will become very innovative. I think that's the single most important agenda which will really drive innovation and entrepreneurship of people in India. But I have a problem because parents do school projects for their children in the United States too. So I'm not sure what the answer is. <laughs> All right. There's a question there as well. Can we get a mic here, please? Hi, my name is Deepak Kemani, but I just want to take from that question which was left over. You said that parents need to stop doing their school projects. Don't the schools know that the parents are doing these projects? Do you have a question? I, 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 I'll, I'll just come. <laughs> My question is to Whitney. Uh, you have a background in financial services also, right? I'm also yes. from financial services. So the disruption which has happened in financial services which can be talked about is robo-advice. Do you think anything else can be taken forward from there? Because robo-advice can be given only to those people who do not have access. Uh, to a personal financial advisor or who do not, who can do things on their own. Can this be taken to another level? I think the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the question, uh, really building on what Sam said earlier, is that the question becomes is, is there a problem that someone needs to solve? And how do they solve that problem? I mean, I look at a company like Stripe. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but Stripe has made it possible for small and medium-sized businesses to transact across the globe. And so it will be taken forward to the extent that there's a problem that needs to be solved that's not getting solved. And so the answer is yes, and maybe it should be you because you're in financial services and it sounds like there's some problems that you see that need to be solved, and I, I hope you'll go out and do it. Okay, we're running out of time on this panel, so maybe one last question. Can I encourage 
uh, all the people at the back, all the back benches know. Here, yeah. this gentleman yeah. has had his hand up for a bit. Uh, hi, m my name is Harish and I represent an organization called Droid Innovations. Uh, we work around innovations in the country. Uh, we do a lot of small innovations, help a lot of small guys. Currently, I am working with around 50 odd innovations. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank your ET and all the people who have come over here to take innovation and disruption to another level. Uh, I would only request two things, you know, because we need such platforms. And I find people who are innovators and who want to do disruptive innovations. I'm not just talking about IT innovations, but we work with a lot of different kinds of innovations like, you know, people who are sitting there. Could Mira I uh, and kindly ask you to So uh, can, I, can you please yeah. help me, help me to tell how can we take in India, help people who are doing innovations to the next level because there are not enough platforms to take them to the next level. We need people. And so, somebody from the platform can help us in doing that. Scaling of a business idea, perhaps? Fantasy. Yes, any kind of innovations. See, um, I, can, I can speak about our company. What we do uh, is called Brand Capital. We are part of Times of, uh, Times of India. ET is also part of our group. What we do is we help companies that are in the B2C segment. For example, this is an example, okay? I mean, there are multiple ways to do this. This is one example. We um, help companies in the B2C segment as they grow and they scale up. They need a huge amount of capital for media and advertising. They have to go out and show their product to the market, show their services to the market and get people in. And they don't have the money to spend on this, right? So what we do is we provide them advertising, branding support in all our media and even other medias in some cases for equity. Just like how they sell their equity to get cash to hire people to buy computers and things like that, we take equity for which in return we give them media. This is great help. We have now scaled more than 500 companies and built about 200 real estate developers over the last 15 years. Now, that is one way, it is one small thing that can be done that helps B2C companies in that segment. I think the important thing is, stepping back from there, there should be a national sort of movement or force or task force, whatever you want to call it, that takes a strategic view and this is this all kinds of companies, B2B, B2C, not-for-profit, technology, not food, etc., etc., and then say what kind of methods can be followed to encourage them beyond just giving them capital, beyond just, beyond just giving just talk like we're doing. Really go out and really help companies on a step-by-step -step basis. And I think both industry and the government and do this more. All right, we have about four minutes on the clock, so if we can uh, quickly get closing comments from the panelists here with us today. And let me start with you, Amit. Uh, you were talking about barriers to innovation previously, and I want to come back to that. If we can talk about perhaps mentorship, which is one of the things that a lot of entrepreneurs who speak to us here on the Leaders of Tomorrow say they lack, no matter what business or industry you're in. How perhaps can that be overcome? Oh, I, I think mentorship becomes important because you need a sounding board. So it should actually happen. I think we can have formal processes or whatever. Uh, I, I think go talk to your professors. In fact, just going back to the previous question, why students don't innovate? Because they don't read enough, they don't talk enough, they do not speak enough. So that's exactly what we need to do. We need to just throw out our ideas, interact with people, get feedback from people. In fact, that, that's how things are actually going to happen. So mentorship is important. Uh, build it up and there are ecosystems which actually help you in doing it. There are enough and more ecosystems in the country. The only thing is that we are very shy to really take advice or go to people and talk to them. Hmm. Okay. So my question is more in terms of how do we overcome and uh, Professor Krishnan, how do we overcome the challenges or the drawbacks that we have in our present education system? We love talking about whether entrepreneurship is something that can be taught on the leaders of tomorrow. Your, your views really on that. How do we overcome the drawbacks that we have right now to encourage more innovation? I think it's beginning to happen in small ways. We just need to figure out how to scale it up. For example, the government has a very interesting program called the Atal Innovation Mission. Mm. And one part of that is setting up so-called tinkering labs in schools and colleges. The concept of a tinkering lab is very simple. You are given a free space, you're given lots of material, you're given various small products, you basically have some machining capacity. You can build things and then try them out and you can really experiment with a lot of new ideas you have. So this is just one small example of how we are trying to remove constraints 
the given our numbers, the exam system and grades and all will continue to matter. We can't just wish mm. them away. But we've got to complement that with a lot of other support in the educational system. And I think the tinkering labs, mentorship, idea contests, entrepreneurship contests, business plan contests, there are really a lot of those happening in the country today. And I think we've really got to take those forward and make them more supportive to students. One of the stakeholders as far as innovation is concerned is the government. Uh, I want your opinion on what the role of the government should be. As someone who's so closely involved in social entrepreneurship, should it, be an, uh, should it be an enabler? Because a lot of small businesses tell us, we wish the government would have a hands-off approach, don't get involved. That's the only way real innovation can take place. Uh, I think it's very difficult to wish away the government, finally, because um, policies matter and the government plays an important role in actually making this happen. Like the Atal Innovation Mission has been really doing some wonderful work. Um, I, I think I just want to add a little to what he, he said about innovations. I think yes, in India there are several innovations, but not all of them can be scaled. Um, some of the innovations are so complex. I find that if for scale to be possible, you have to simplify, otherwise it's really not possible to scale. So the first thing, for example, we do when you want to scale an innovation is to see what is it that you can remove, what is inessential, take out the core and then you scale. So I think that um, while a lot of innovations are there, I think you need some kind of a mentorship, people who've already scaled, who can actually say, listen, what is the template of an innovation being scaled? Because I find whether it's in the world of science, research, uh, startups, brilliant ideas, okay? A lot of work is happening on campuses, but they're not going to the next level of scale. So I think government and um, the whole ecosphere actually has to work on this because it's extremely important for the country. Technology, of course, is uh, a component of the ecosystem in Whitney. I, I want to talk to you on that. Um, as businesses are moving towards becoming future ready, there's been talk of AI, for instance, more and more companies here in India are embracing such technology. How do you ensure that the people are then also becoming future ready? Because we've spoken about how leaders are becoming future ready. How do you ensure that your employees are also going with you along this journey? Well, I have a very simple suggestion, but oh, so hard to do. If you look at your life and your day, how much time are you spending studying, thinking, mastering your craft, figuring out how to be world-class at what you do. And I think that this is a simple but very difficult thing. If you will allocate a half an hour every morning to perfecting your craft and understanding your business, you will be future ready. All right, Sam, I'm gonna let you have uh, the last word, 90%. Of an entrepreneur's life is spent raising money, figuring out where the money is going to come, raise, uh, figuring out how they're going to utilize the money that they've got. Uh, Whitney was talking earlier about uh, bootstrapped companies versus companies that are funded. You were saying that you invest into people and not necessarily into the companies or the businesses. Perhaps one thing you'd like to leave our audience with when you talk about evaluating businesses for funding. See, I... Um I just took on this new role and I'm, and I'm evangelizing this simple view, which is, which is all over there, right? When you look at any company, any idea, there are three, four simple things I look at, right? Are you targeting a key problem that is desperately begging to be solved in a market that is, that is meaningful, big? So if I have to become 80% of the market to be successful, I don't want to touch it. If I'm only... If I only need to be 30% market share and I'm successful, I can impact, I want to do it, right? And the second important thing is the people. This is, this is the point that you're saying. So it doesn't matter, I would any day invest in an average idea that has a great team rather than a great idea that's got an average team, right? So it's the individual that owns the innovation, drives the innovation, fulfills the innovation because that innovation is that individual's dream, really, right? So it is a dream machine, right? So the thing is, these two things, when these two things are there, the capital comes, people come, everything else will come. But these two things are the absolute pillars of any idea. 
All right, we've run out of time. Whitney, Sam, Mira, Professor Krishna and Amit, thank you so much for your time here. Thank you to the audience as well. We've got some interesting questions today. And thank you for taking the time. Thank you. Thank you.